from Bloomberg's World Headquarters in Midtown Manhattan. I'm Matt Miller. And I'm Katie Greifeld in for Kaylee Lines. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. It's a look at the people, transactions, and technology shaping up the world of decentralized finance. Coming up, the cryptoverse has seen what seems like a lifetime of ups and downs already this year. We'll discuss where we go from here with Fred Thiel. He is the CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings. We're also going to talk about the fallout from the SEC crackdown with one of the biggest advocates of crypto and especially Bitcoin, MicroStrategies, Michael Saylor. And we're going to take a look at the mass exodus from global exchange traded products linked to the industry with analysts saying that investors have abandoned the sector without a plan to come back anytime soon. That's all ahead, but first let's get a snapshot of what's going on in the markets. We are testing the lows that we saw in March on Bitcoin. Right now down only about uh, one, two tenths of one percent, but um, getting uh, down to the 25,000s, 25,850 is the level there. Ether also coming off just a little bit, very little change, but 17,000, sorry, $1,737 is where we see Ether trading right now. We actually see a gain in uh, Binance coin, even though it is on the, SEC list, of course, and eToro has um, stopped U.S. users from making new purchases of Binance Coin. BNB up 4.5% right now, $234.32. We also see a gain in Coinbase shares. We're going to talk about this today, up more than 2% right now to $51.60. Katie? All right, let's also take a look at what investors are actually doing. I take a look at the exchange traded product world to do that globally, because over in Europe, over in Asia, you do actually have funds that can physically hold Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies that doesn't exist in the US. But if you look globally, you can see uh, 2020, 2021, those were the boom times. 2021, obviously almost $10 billion came into those ETBs. ETPs rather. Then you look at what the past year and a half has brought and it's pretty much nothing. You saw a little bit of an outflow in 2022 and then you saw a little bit more in 2023. But it feels like, Matt, basically it's a ghost town. Those who have been washed out or were looking to sell have already done so. Mm. And now you're left with this sort of status quo. Yeah, the irony is these exchange traded products have done better than any others. And yet um, they have no money in them. So no one is winning. Let's get over to the latest crypto crackdown. Binance US has urged a federal judge to reject an SEC request to freeze billions of dollars of assets on the crypto exchange. Olga Karif, Bloomberg crypto reporter, joins us now for more. So, Olga, what do we know? Binance, the U.S. arm of Binance, has said its business will be absolutely destroyed if this move is made. Absolutely. And they said that uh, this is already underway because after the SEC filed its uh, suit against Binance uh, Monday of last week, uh, they said one of their banking partners already uh, told them to sort of leave and they're worried that additional uh, sort of measures, such as the freezing of assets, will force other banking partners to do the same. And they're worried about how they're going to pay staff and, uh, you know, just operate their business. So that's what's going on with Binance, Binance US. Talk to us about the latest with Coinbase, of course. We saw that lawsuit come down from the SEC against Coinbase last week. What's the latest? So the latest is uh, Coinbase is hoping for sort of legislative solutions to their problems. Uh, there is a bill going through, um, uh, you know, <laughs> work in the House, and they're hoping that perhaps that will help them sort of uh, get a leg up in this case and essentially resolve their problems. So uh, Binance is setting up, I guess, for a case, and has it countersued as well? You know, Binance is basically setting up its uh, hired a whole bunch of lawyers, including, uh, you know, some very high up former officials from the SEC. So they're really gearing up to fight this case. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, documents being filed uh, on both sides. Olga, really appreciate the update. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Olga Karif. Now we have Fred Thiel. He is Marathon Digital Chairman and CEO joining us now. But let's take a look at what Coinbase CEO Brian Armstrong had to say on the latest SEC crackdown. Take a listen. This was not um, unexpected. You know, we've been in discussion with the SEC for a long, long time. 
even going back to before we were a public company, we started sharing with them how we operate our business, how we list assets on the platform, how we think about our staking pro program. And through a large number of dialogues back and forth, they allowed us to become a public company. Um, you know, we had many discussions with them in the last year when their, their tone started to change. And so, Fred, let's talk about that change in tone, because you heard Brian Armstrong say that. And as a result, you have a lot of crypto companies saying that they're looking overseas, that they're looking to get out of the U.S. What's Marathon's view? Are you looking at offshore opportunities here? Well, we recently announced uh, a new project in the UAE where we're building one of the largest um, digital asset uh, operations or mining uh, in Abu Dhabi. We're also looking in other places. Uh, our goal longer term is to be about 50% offshore, 50% onshore. Uh, you know, Bitcoin is treated a little bit differently than broader crypto. Uh, the SEC and the CFTC have both given clarity that Bitcoin is a commodity, it's not a security. So um, Bitcoin is being treated a little bit differently and I think the situation around Bitcoin is different. That being said, Clearly, you know, all the way up to the top at the White House, the economic report that they issued in January had a very different tone than the one they issued prior year. So clearly this is coming from the top that, you know, crypto is bad in their views. Um, but we're very hopeful that the legislation that is going through Congress now uh, will hopefully add some market structure guidelines and alleviate some of the lack of clarity that exists today so that the regulators can operate in a uh, more friendly way towards the industry that will allow people to innovate, and build businesses in the U.S. as opposed to just moving offshore. Is there any hope, Fred, in kind of fighting this crackdown from the SEC and the court of public opinion? I mean, you mentioned legislation. Obviously, that's, um, I guess, the, the main mechanism um, through which you, you would uh, change um, the SEC's mandate, because so many of these coins, you can argue that they're a commodity and not a security. Yeah, so I, I think part of the challenge is that with no clear legal rules, legislation around this, the SEC's mandate is seemingly a little broader than it should be. There have been some mentions of overreach. Uh, I think there is a Republican member of the House that has put forth uh, a bill that essentially would restructure the SEC. So I think momentum is building towards people really starting to pay attention to this. Uh, at the end of the day, Congress needs to provide very clear legislation. And then I think the SEC and the CFTC have to come to terms regarding how this is all going to be regulated. But uh, you know, a lot of this is definitely um, potentially a bit of strong arming. If you think about what the SEC is doing, by essentially scaring people enough, they will achieve the end that they're looking for, which is to move all this offshore. Um, you look at all these altcoins that have been delisted by exchanges. You look at Robinhood delisting altcoins and stopping trading in crypto. You know, essentially, the SEC is achieving its end without having to take all these people to court. So it's a matter of who gets to the finish line first and what happens come next year. You know, we have three presidential candidates who have come out on the Republican side that are pro-Bitcoin. Uh, and I think momentum, again, is building for at least a, a more positive environment for Bitcoin uh, in the U.S. Uh, but we'll have to see what Congress can do to really rein things in and get everybody aligned around how things should operate so people can get back to business. You mentioned Robin Hood. We've also seen eToro stop um new purchases of these, the tainted 19 uh, coins, so to speak. Uh, are you also avoiding any, any uh, tokens that the SEC has deemed securities? Well, we're a pure Bitcoin company. So in our case, we focus on Bitcoin. It's been declared a commodity by both the SEC and the CFTC. So we're continuing just business as usual. And Fred, I'd love to get your thoughts on the mining industry. Take a step back and talk about the state of Bitcoin mining, because obviously Bitcoin's had a great 2023, up well over 50 percent, but still down dramatically from its peaks. What has that meant for your margins? What does your current break even rate look like and how does that compare to the rest of the industry? So the industry has been going through a big upgrade cycle. There's some recent reports that have been issued that show that uh, energy consumption is maintaining at the same level, but at the same time, the global hash rate or the amount of compute power that's applied to Bitcoin mining has increased substantially. We've grown substantially. We've doubled our capacity 
um, year to date over the end of last year, and we'll continue to grow it more throughout this year. And we're using the most modern, most energy efficient machines. What we're seeing is miners that had older machines have been upgrading those to more energy efficient um, machines, which is making the overall industry more energy efficient. So I think people are continuing to grow. Uh, margins are essentially staying flat to a little bit lower because as global hash rate grows, the difficulty increases. But um, Bitcoin price has obviously moved in the right direction this year. Mm -hmm. So I think what we're going to see is a slow uptick in the price of Bitcoin over the balance of this year leading into the halving next year. At that point, there's a big impact to margins because companies' cost to mine will essentially double. Right. And so it'll be very interesting to see uh, you know, miners are very focused now on becoming more energy efficient. We have one of the most energy efficient fleets in the industry operating at uh, somewhere around 24 joules per terahash or watts per terahash where the average industry mm -hmm. or the industry average rather is in the 40s. So I think it's going to be a bit of a period of people continue to upgrade and then there'll be some sort of cleansing post the halving next year. I'm glad you brought up the halving because if we take a look forward at that hypothetically, uh, when we do get to that point, what would you expect the mining industry to look like? Will, they, will there be fewer miners after we get through the halving? I think what's going to happen is the larger miners that have most modern fleets, the best energy costs um, and are the most efficient are going to thrive, uh, while the smaller miners that either can't raise capital, can't upgrade their machines, and can't get out of potentially more expensive energy contracts are either going to have to consolidate or essentially go away. Um, as well, you're seeing more miners moving offshore. There's some great stranded energy opportunities in Latin America, Asia, uh, in Africa that are coming to market at very low energy prices. And I think you're going to see you know, this industry continue to chase the lowest cost of energy. You'll also see miners focus more on starting to own energy generation because instead of being parasitic load on the grid, you're going to see miners move behind the meter. This is what we do. We sit behind the meter at wind farms typically. So we get to use that stranded energy and not take it off the grid. Uh, but at the same time, you're, you're going to see miners start owning and investing in uh, energy projects to develop their own energy whether that's methane flare, whether that's landfill methane, whether that's solar wind, et cetera. And I think the miners together with the renewable energy companies are gonna be the largest really investors in renewable energy projects in the US because we have a very big problem in the US. There's a lack of transmission capacity to ship the energy from the renewable energy farms to the consumer. And the only way you can get these projects financed is there has to be a customer for the energy and Bitcoin miners make the ideal customer for that. All so right. I think you're going to continue to see a lot of progress there. Fred, got to leave it there. Really appreciate your time today. That is Fred Teal. He is Marathon Digital Chairman and CEO. Thank you so much. Coming up on this program, Michael Saylor, MicroStrategy co-founder and executive chairman, joins us next. And to access all of the latest data on news on crypto, check out CryptGo on the terminal. This is Bloomberg. shoes drop last year it'll just be kind of nothing crazy happening and if you had to make me say something i would say regulatory clarity is the one thing nobody's expecting and there are a few ways that could happen and that could be the black swan and that could be the positive black swan that we're all waiting for the next huge bad shoe to drop and that was Dan Moorhead, founder and CEO of Pantera Capital, speaking at the Bloomberg Invest Conference last week. Michael Saylor joins us now, MicroStrategy co-founder and executive chairman. And Michael, the reason I uh, picked that soundbite to play is that I feel like we already have uh, clarity in terms of the U.S. regulatory regime for now. Um, Gary Gensler uh, at the SEC seems to want to stop any crypto companies um, in their tracks and either have them close their businesses down completely or move offshore. How do you think? Uh, how do you think it's all playing out? Well, I think MicroStrategy's view since 2020 has been that the only institutional grade investable asset in the crypto space is Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the universally globally acknowledged digital commodity in this industry. 
I think it's pretty clear that uh, the regulators don't see a legitimate path forward for cryptocurrencies like the stable coins, crypto securities like the tokens mentioned. They don't they don't have any love for crypto derivatives. They don't have any love for crypto tokens, and and they have a view of crypto exchanges which is uh, far constrained. I mean, their view is crypto exchanges should changes should trade and uh, and hold uh, pure digital commodities like Bitcoin. And so the entire industry is is kind of destined uh, to be rationalized down to a Bitcoin focused industry well, with maybe a half a dozen to a dozen other other proof of work tokens. So, Michael, what happens then um, to the exchanges in the U.S. at least, it seems you know, if they're only going to offer trading in Bitcoin or other, uh, you know, clearly pure commodity uh, tokens, that's not going to be a great business model. Do exchanges in the U.S. just go away? I take a different point of view there. I think there's been a lot of confusion uh, because of the 25,000 other cryptos and because of, uh, of all of the uh, crypto securities that have been angling to position themselves as the next Bitcoin or a better Bitcoin. So now I think that the public is beginning to realize that Bitcoin is the next Bitcoin. The next logical step is for Bitcoin to 10x from here and then 10x again. So. Eventually, I have confidence that the crypto exchanges will come around to realizing uh, that Bitcoin really is the dominant asset in this space. And their business models are fine when Bitcoin goes up by a factor of 10. And, uh, you know, we can see that the dominance of Bitcoin in the, in the crypto economy, as measured by coin market cap, has moved from 40 to 48 percent this year alone. But I think that as the stable coins and the tokens go away, that long term dominance is headed for 80 percent. And I think what you've got to remember is the reason that we don't have mega institutional money flowing into this space mm -hmm. is confusion and anxiety. When that disappears, you're going to see mega amounts of money flow in the space and the business models will be just fine focused on Bitcoin. Michael, I want to ask what the future of some of these centralized exchanges does look like right now, because to your point that maybe once the confusion clears up, more institutions will come in. When you have a company like Coinbase, obviously there's a big regulatory overhang right now for normal investors in the space, not the big institutions. Do you see them moving away from these sort of centralized exchanges, maybe gravitating more towards cold wallets from here? Well, you know, I. I think that there's a, a massive need for uh, exchanges to help people acquire Bitcoin and custody Bitcoin, especially as the pension funds, the insurance companies, the banks, the institutional investors get into the space. Companies like uh, Grayscale need to have a custodian. So, so I see a lot of bullish things for Bitcoin on the horizon. I think the accounting uh, treatment, the upcoming halving, the explosion in the half r hash rate, and also um, the clarity that has come out of the SEC of late is actually uh, laying the foundation for the next bull run. And, uh, and there is a place for crypto exchanges to help people buy Bitcoin, sell Bitcoin, custody Bitcoin. And, uh, and uh, I don't think that's going away. I think that's going to be a great business. Michael, how does MicroStrategy actually accumulate its Bitcoin? And has that process changed at all? We use um, a variety of, uh, of institutional grade um, Bitcoin companies. We work with Coinbase and we have worked with Coinbase. We have a number of institutional grade custodians as well. Um, MicroStrategy has been kind of special in this regard because unlike, uh, say, um, an ETF or the like, we're able to access the Bitcoin spot markets and hold Bitcoin. And we're also able to access the equity and the debt markets uh, as we pursue our Bitcoin acquisition strategy. How is, I mean, you've outperformed Bitto and uh, Grayscale and other, you know, ET exchange traded products year to date. How, how is your strategy, though, in your company different from one of these, you know, products that just hold large amounts of Bitcoin? 
Well, we're an operating company, so we have a profitable software business, and so we can sweep the cash flows of our software business into Bitcoin. Our aim is is to allow institutional investors to get Bitcoin exposure, but without charging them a fee and generating a yield when we can. And because we're able to tap the debt markets, we're able to issue debt. We're also able to refinance or pay back our debt, like when we retired our Silvergate loan earlier this year. We're able to issue equity when it's accretive. We're able to purchase Bitcoin with uh, with um, cash flows when it's accretive. So those are our flexibilities you have as an operating company. If you're an SEC 40 company like uh, an ETP or, or like Grayscale as a trust, you can't really do those things. And I mean, the result is, yeah, you know, Bitcoin is up 55 percent this year to date. MicroStrategy is up 92 percent this mm -hmm. year to date. All right, Michael, I really appreciate your time. It's great to catch up with you. That is Michael Saylor. He is MicroStrategy co-founder and executive chairman. Coming up, the SEC designating 19 tokens as securities. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Crypto. I'm Katie Greifeld in for Kaylee Lines alongside Matt Miller. Now to some crypto stories that caught our attention this week. eToro is no longer allowing U.S. customers to open new positions in a number of crypto tokens. The Israel-based social trading platform tweeted that the changes will take effect on July 12th for tokens including Algorand, Dash, and Polygon. These limits come as the SEC labeled 19 tokens unregistered securities in its latest crackdown on crypto exchanges. I will say that the Polygon token is actually called Matic. Oh. Genesis has revised its bankruptcy plan. According to Coindesk, the crypto lender cited substantial agreement on major issues from mediated discussions with its parent company, DCG. This comes after Genesis first filed its bankruptcy timeline back in January. And Matt, back to those tokens, because Bloomberg News out with a story today titled Tainted 19. These are the tokens connected to the SEC lawsuits last week. And as you can see in the chart, uh, there's been a sharp decline since those lawsuits hit. Yeah, I think that's uh, really interesting um, or predictable, right? Obviously, um, when you have companies stop doing business in these tokens, they're going to drop in price, and the ones that they can continue, that Michael Saylor can continue to buy, are going to rise. Yeah, it's a textbook TradFi kind of reaction. Bad news, you sell off. TradFi. Coming up next week, Brett Harrison, Architect Financial Technology CEO, joins us at 1 p.m. Eastern, an interview you don't want to miss. This is Bloomberg.